Praise the Lord, everybody. Would you stand tonight? Praise the Lord. We've come to give God the glory tonight. We've come to worship Him. We've come to give Him the glory and honor that's due Him. Would you take a few moments tonight to love Him and worship Him? Savior, we're so thankful for You. Hallelujah. Every day, God, that we live, we appreciate You so much more than the day before, God. You're so good to us. Thank You, Lord, for the breath that You gave us today to live for You, to serve You, to worship You. Hallelujah. God, we're so grateful to you. Thank you, Lord, more than ever before, God. We love you. We appreciate you from the bottom of our hearts to the depths of our souls, Savior. We love you. We worship and adore you. Hallelujah. Let's sing. Let's love the Lord tonight with all of our heart, mind, soul, and strength. Would you love him as we sing tonight? I love you. I love you, I love you, Lord, today, because you cared for me in such a special way. And yes, I praise you, I lift you up, I magnify your name, that's why my heart is filled. Hallelujah, my heart is filled for praise for you today, God. I love, I love you, you, I love you, I love you, Lord, today, because you care for me in such a special way. And yes, I praise you, I lift you up. Way back on Calvary, and yes, I praise you, I lift you up, I magnify your name, that's why my heart is filled with praise, oh, I love you, Lord, my heart is filled with praise, I love you, I love you, Lord, I love you, Lord, today. Because you care for me in such a special way. And yes, I praise you. I lift you up. I magnify your name. That's why my heart is filled with praise. Way back on Calvary, yes, I praise you, I lift you up, I magnify your name, that's why my heart is filled with praise. Sing it again as you love him, my heart, my, heart, my mind, my soul, my mind, it belongs to you, my God. Soul Christ for me way back on Calvary yes I praise you I lift you up I magnify your name that's why my heart is filled with praise oh yes oh yes I love you I love you I love you, Lord, today, because you care for me in such a special way. Yes, I praise you, I lift you up, I magnify your name. That's why my heart is filled 
with praise. From your heart tonight, would you love him? Hallelujah. Would you give him praise tonight? Truly, he's worthy. Savior, I love you. I love you. I love you. Thank you, Lord. You paid the price a long time ago, God, that we could feel what we feel in our hearts. Thank you, Lord. You've been so good to us. I want to magnify you tonight, Lord. Hallelujah. Magnify the Lord. This is one for He is worthy to be praised. Do you feel that way today? Hallelujah. Oh, magnify the Lord. For He is worthy to be praised. Oh, and your mercy. Hallelujah. Truly, he is the one that's worthy to be magnified, to glorify and worship. Amen. God bless you. You can be seated for a few moments tonight. Say we're thankful for those who were able to make it tonight and uh, have already felt the presence of the Lord in this place. Looking forward to the remainder of the service and then also uh, for the teaching of the word tonight. Looking forward to what God has laid upon our pastor's heart tonight. Amen. I love to hear the word of the Lord. Well, that's several of you. I love to hear the preaching of the word of the Lord. 
Amen. Sometimes with the way that we are doing things now, sometimes on Sunday I will listen to uh, sometimes three or four services during the course of the day on Sunday. That's one good thing that's come out of all this nonsense, uh, all this stuff that's going on, is you get to be in church all day on Sunday. And so I, I appreciate that. I love that uh, because it gives me an opportunity to hear more of the word of the Lord. And if we're going to be saved, it's by preaching of the word. Amen. That's the way it's going to happen. Amen. Just in the way of announcements, uh, Brother Robert has asked specifically for this uh, coming Saturday. They had planned it for the other Saturday, but uh, there were several that were out of town. Then others were going out of town. Others had other plans that they wanted to take care of. So please, if you're available, make yourself available to be here this Saturday. And uh, he wants to get started at 7 o'clock uh, so we can come through and get as much done as we can in a short time. He's shooting to be done by 10, maybe no later than 11. So that gives you the rest of the day to do things with your family and to get some uh, honeydew uh, on the honeydew list done. Uh, so let's be here at 7 o'clock. Let's come. Uh, and I don't know about you, but I, when I am here and working with the brethren and talking with them, fellowshipping with them, especially after we're done, I enjoy the fellowship being together with the men of God and just taking a few moments just to talk, reminisce, and talk about how things are going. Amen. So be here, and let's come expecting a good time in the Holy Ghost. Also, service will be here on Sunday morning. Again, it's planned on being outside. And uh, be here at 945 for prayer. 10 o'clock service kicks off. Uh, so let's come expecting a good time in the Holy Ghost. And let's just believe God for great things. Amen. I'm believing God for an outpouring of the Holy Ghost. And believe that God, it's the will of God that people be saved. He said daily such as should be saved. Amen. So it's the will of God. We know it's the will of God for him to fill people with the Holy Ghost. Amen. So let's come expecting a good time. And uh, just look forward to this weekend for what God has in store. Remember your giving. Be faithful uh, to giving in the house of the Lord. Then also... And just a couple of needs that I'm, we're asking you to pray for. I know that uh, we were out of town this weekend, and I know the requests were made, and I appreciate your prayer so very much. Uh, but my cousin, several years younger than I am, is in a very dire situation, Steve. Uh, Steve is, you, you just have to meet Steve to know Steve. Uh, he's one of those guys that's just one of a kind. He's kind of the... A life of the party, no matter what we were doing, Steve was right in the middle making everybody laugh and just enjoying themselves. Many times now, when I would go back to Illinois, Steve is the one that I would stay with and just have grown close. Well, we have, I, I, it's hard to explain to somebody that doesn't have a family that's real close, but I look at him more than just a cousin. He's grown up, we've grown up together. I look at him as a brother, but more than that as a friend. A dear friend and uh, we got calls last night before we went to bed and this morning and they're still saying that uh, there's a good chance he may not have made it through the day but he's made it this far last thing I did was check my phone before I walked in tonight so I'm just asking that you pray for our family amen he has children of course a couple of boys and uh, one's kind of it's kind of an uncomfortable situation and uh, he probably won't be able to get released to uh, come to the funeral, and it's going to be tough on him. And so we're just asking that you pray for him. His name is Sheldon, and then also Steve that's been here in church with us a number of times. Grandchildren, and they're all very close to him, worship him, love him. And maybe worship is not a good word, but uh, they adore him. Maybe I can put it that way because he loves him. So he loved them so much. So I ask that you pray for him. We want to continue to pray. I heard on the news this afternoon, and not too long before I came to church tonight, that they're still struggling big time with the fires. Uh, they still don't have them anywhere near under control. It's a very serious situation, and it seems like there's more and more uh, damage that you hear the reports of all the houses and lives that have been destroyed by this fire. Uh, misplaced uh, and uh, displaced, and then just... All of the things that are going on surrounding that. Pray for those that are battling the fires. And then also let's continue to pray uh, that uh, people that uh, have been affected by the coronavirus, that God will touch them 
and he will be with them and heal them. Do you have a need tonight? Is there someone that you want God to move on specifically? There's an individual that you're thinking of. Amen. I want you to have that individual in your mind as we begin to pray tonight. Let's take a few moments to pray for these needs. Would you pray? Hallelujah. Let's sing another good chorus as we turn the service to Pastor. Lean on you, Lord. Oh, yes. I lean on you, Lord. For the strength that I need, I lean on you. When I don't know just what to do, I got the faith you're gonna see me through. You'll supply my every need. I lean. Oh, I believe it tonight. He'll supply your every need. I lean on you, Lord. Oh yes. I lean on you, Lord. For the strength that I need, I lean on you. When I don't know. Just what to do, I got the faith you're going to see me through. To supply my every need, I lean on oh, you. Yes. I lean on you, Lord. I lean on you, Lord. For the strength that I need, I lean on you. When I don't know just what to do, I got the faith you're going to see me through. You'll supply my every need. I lean on you. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. We praise you. We honor you. We glorify you, God. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be the name of the Lord. And He is a good God. He is a good God. Amen. Even when I can't see Him, He's still there. When I can't feel Him, He's still there. When I, one preacher says, when I can't trace Him, I can still trust Him. And um, I know that my God is, is a good God. Amen. Good to have you in the house of the Lord with us tonight. Longing for the day when, when uh, everybody can be fellowshipping together the way we're accustomed to it, the way we're used to it. And that would be a marvelous thing. Amen. Thank the Lord. Praise God. Well, I want to take you this evening to the book of Genesis chapter 3 for my text to you a friend of mine was reading his text and um, he was going a complete different direction and while he was reading his text some words just jumped out at me and so i bring it to you on this wednesday night i'd like to get into another series but i'm not there yet and so I'm just going to give you uh, what I do have 
available. I actually had two messages set one aside, and uh, but I'll get to it one of these days. Praise God. Genesis chapter 3, verse 17. This is in the midst of when God has sought out Adam and Eve because they hid from God. Then, uh, then the discussion took place of whose fault it was. God talked to Adam. Adam blamed it on Eve. Eve blamed it on the serpent. God began with the serpent and he cursed the serpent. And then he dealt with Eve. Right now in this passage, uh, we're going to deal with a portion where he deals with Adam. So let's look at verse 17. And unto Adam, God said, Because thou hast hearkened unto the voice of thy wife, and hast eaten of the tree of which I commanded thee, saying, Thou shalt not eat of it. Notice this next phrase. Cursed is the ground for thy sake. Cursed is the ground for thy sake. In sorrow shalt thou eat of it all the days of thy life. Thorns also and thistles shall it bring forth to thee. Thou shalt eat of the herb of the field. In the sweat of thy face shalt thou eat bread till thou return unto the ground, for out of it wast thou taken for dust thou art, and unto dust shalt thou return. Out of verse 17, where he said, Cursed is the ground for thy sake. I want to take my title and I want to talk to you. I don't know how long this is going to be. It might be one of my shorter Wednesday nights. But I want to talk to you about cursed for my sake. Cursed for my sake. Pray with me, Jesus. I praise you and I love you. You've been a mighty, mighty good God. And I want to give you glory in all things. I want to praise you for your infinite wisdom, your knowledge, your faithfulness in all things. I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. We honor you tonight. Thank you for faithful people. Thank you for people who love your word and love this message. In Jesus' name, amen, amen. God bless you. Praise God. Anybody here wish you could get a paycheck without working? <laughs> Wouldn't that be nice? You know, you just dream of being rich, where you could live life luxuriously, maybe own one of those big ocean-going yachts, sail around the world, get yourself one of those expensive airplanes and uh, ride in luxury, go to Paris and eat lunch, you know, just, just do things. You ever, you ever thought about how much those airplanes cost just to operate? just to operate. I was reading the other day where somebody had a private jet, uh, just like one of the passenger jets, you know, it's one of the world's largest private jets, cost them $700,000 an hour to operate. $700,000 an hour. All the crew and everything else that is required and uh, maybe, maybe God has a reason for us not to have that. But anyway, if you wished you could live in the lap of luxury without the effort and the life of, of labor, well, I got news for you. It's Adam's fault. Blame Adam. So you, you, you really can't. I know Adam blamed it on the woman. The woman blamed it on the devil. But uh, the responsibility really fell upon the man, fell upon Adam, because he was the one that got instructions from God and if he had obeyed God, everybody underneath him would have obeyed God. And, and so uh, he ate the fruit from the forbidden tree. And, and uh, all of this uh, difficulty in life that we have and go through, it all goes back to our great ancestor, Adam. It resulted 
in God cursing the ground as a result of Adam's sin. Now I want to I want to point this out to you right up here at, at the very outset of my message to you this evening that God did not curse Adam. God cursed the ground. You know we you say you're splitting hairs. No. I think it's very very important that we do we we recognize the scripture for exactly what it is saying because it was not Adam that was cursed it was the ground that was cursed and there is a major distinction right here between the two of them and the reason I want to make uh, emphasis upon this is this the devil will will take when you make a mistake and you do something wrong the devil will take that mistake and tell you that you are a failure. God looks at your mistake and tells you that there are consequences to your actions. You've got to fix what you did wrong. But the devil takes it and applies it to your entire character and life. And I want you to understand something. Hear me because I've, I've done this for 40 plus years now. I want you to hear me and hear me well. Falling in one area does not make you a failure. Doesn't mean it's a life sentence. Doesn't mean that you're stuck with it all of your life. It does mean that you may have to dwell with consequences. I wish that God would as much as he washes away our sins and throws them into the sea of forgetfulness, removes them as far as the east is from the west. I wish he'd do it between these two points. Anybody know what I'm talking about? I wish he could just eradicate the memory and, and, and all of that. Well, consequences are what comes from our poor decisions, our bad decisions, things that we do uh, when we oftentimes no better, but that does not mean that we have to live a lifetime of condemnation. Condemnation is what the devil wants to pin on you to stay with you forever, and that is not necessary. I, I believe I have told you guys, but I think it bears repeating, pastored a good man, one of my one of the most favorite men that I've ever pastored, and he has gone on to his reward now. But uh, Duthel Davis was just one of my all-time favorite people. Uh, Duthel had early uh, rheumatoid arthritis, the kind that cripples your hands and your feet and your body, and uh, never crippled his smile. His smile was always just just way up there. His attitude was just a fabulous, excellent attitude. He loved preaching. Long before I became his pastor, he loved preaching. He would be an encourager to the pastor, the preacher, whoever it was that filled that pulpit. And uh, I remember camp meetings. He always sat right on the front or the second row, right up there as far as he could get. And because he oftentimes would come in with, with his um, arm things to help him walk and whatnot, uh, people would let him. They just kind of feel like, well, Duthel needs to get up there. Um, but but he, he loved preaching. And it was one of those people that a preacher, Brother O'Brien, would look at in order to gain a little help and support because you have a way actually of feeding good things back to the pulpit when we preach. And so little things of encouragement. Duthel was one of those guys. But if you knew Duthel's background, he was anything but a good boy in his past. He had been a very bad boy in his past. He was a Marine and uh, he became one of the, the, um, the, one of the guys that took care of the officer's bar. Uh, and he probably took care of the officers in making sure that they had anything that they wanted. He was a very immoral man. He was a, he was a very ungodly man. 
but there was a time that, uh, that he went back and, uh, to Mississippi and Richard Hurd was the evangelist preaching. He preached a revival. Richard Hurd back in those years preached a lot of, of hell fire. He preached a lot of the judgments of God and the return of the Lord. And it got a hold of Duthal and Duthal went to the altar and he prayed through. Now when I say he prayed through, I'm not talking about he prayed through and he took six years to get over his past, to get rid of his addictions and, and all of that kind of stuff. When, when God uh, forgave Duthal and filled him with the Holy Ghost, God delivered him right then from those things that he had been doing. And he turned his back on that lifestyle. And he became a dear saint of God. When he got this arthritis, this crippling arthritis, you would have thought that somehow, you know how so many people, they're always full of complaints. You know, how are you feeling? You don't ask that question to some people, I mean, not unless you've got a couple of hours to waste. Because they're going to unload on you. They're going to tell you all the troubles. Duthal never did that. He always had a smile and was full of jokes and full of positive things. But he hurt every day of his life. He was in pain. But he told me, he said, Brother Bodie, I don't pray for God to take my arthritis away. He said, I feel like God gave this to me to remind me of what kind of life I lived in the past and what I have done. And I, I want to take it as a gift to remind me and to keep me to where I ought to be in living for God. I wish that spirit and that attitude could get into so many other people because so many times when we make a little boo-boo, we do something wrong, the devil wants to take it and use it somehow against us to keep us away from the church, to keep us away from living for God, to do those kind of things. And, and, and if God has to bring correction and God brings upon us the consequences of our actions, unfortunately, too many people get mad at God for it. God, why did you let this happen to me? Not realizing that what they may suffer through may be that God's way of cursing some things for your sake, not cursing you. Let's get that down well. Not cursing you. I am not cursed. I am blessed of the Lord. I may have to deal with stuff, but I am not cursed. Are you, are you with me tonight? You understand what I'm telling you? I want to take you to Psalms 119. And most of you know that Psalms 119 is broken down into eight verses apiece. Everyone starting with the letter of the, the, uh, the Hebrew alphabet. And actually, you can, and I can't see it because we can't read Hebrew and the original language it was written in. But in the original language, the, the Greek or the Hebrew letter that starts the section is also the first letter of every one of those verses. And it was a way that the, the writer helped children learn and memorize the Word of God. And uh, what, a, what a great piece of literature uh, this particular psalm is. But when you get down to the eighth section and you begin to read in verse 64, the psalmist is beginning to tell you about the goodness of God, that God is good. And this is why I stressed it at the very outset of my standing up here tonight. He's not good sometimes. He is good all the time. Whatever God does, he is good. This entire section uh, from, from verse 64 on down is dealing with the fact that God is good. Yes. Now watch this, because this doesn't sound like goodness. But go down to verse 67. Before I was afflicted, I went astray. But now I have kept my word, or kept thy word. I, I went astray before I was afflicted, but there was something about that correction that you put upon me 
that it did what it was meant to do and it put me into the right vein, the right place where I ought to be. Now, a reiteration of that takes place just four verses later in verse 71. It is good for me that I have been afflicted, that I might learn thy statutes. So again, you have the reiteration of affliction and learning how to abide by the will and the word of God. It was good that I have been afflicted. It was good for me because I've learned things about you that I would not have known, could not have known any other way. It is bringing me into alignment with God. And when God chastises you, we could talk about Romans chapter 12, but when God chastises you, it is not because he hates you. You are not cursed. He does it because he knows he's got to bring you into harmony so that you can live that good life that God wants you to live. Let's go to, let's go to Hebrews chapter 12. I think I said Romans, but I should have said Hebrews. Hebrews chapter 12, and go down to verse 10. For they verily, talking about our parents, talking about the time they had to correct us. He said, they verily for a few days chastened us after their own pleasure. But then he says, but he, speaking of God, for our profit, that we might become partakers of his holiness. He has an agenda in this. He has a purpose in this. God, whatever he does, he is doing it for my good. Verse 11, now no chastening for the present seemeth to be joyous, but grievous. Nevertheless, afterward, it yieldeth, and I love the, the word, the language of the scripture. He says, it yieldeth the peaceable fruit of righteousness unto them that are exercised thereby. God is doing it so that he can produce in you the kind of fruit, the kind of results that he wants to come out of your life. He is cultivating your ground. He is working on you. Uh, years ago, we read uh, books by Dr. Dobson when we were young and didn't have children and preparing for the day. I'm not sure how much good it did, but we read them. He, uh, he wrote one that was called Dare to Discipline. Then he wrote one on the strong-minded child. Then he wrote one on Dare to Discipline Part Two or, or the second edition. And, um, and I'm not sure which book it was in where he covers this, but the concept of, of disciplining children, unfortunately in the world's mind, and I, I was reminded of this tonight when I was preparing or today, and it, they're literally newspapers, articles, written against Dr. Dobson because he dares use the biblical terminology of spare the rod, spoil the child. And so he's smart enough and he acknowledges it that discipline is not just spanking. Discipline is shaping. Discipline is training. Discipline is putting them in a certain mindset or direction. And, uh, and yes, it may require the consequences of rebellion. It may, it may needful, but hopefully, if discipline is not right, done right, those things are unnecessary. Just depends on how smart your kid is. But anyway, here's one of the interesting things that Dr. Dobson puts out there when he's talking about the psychology of a child, that when a child does something that is wrong and they are not corrected for it, that child cannot come to a place of wholeness or mental rest because of it. 
if they, if they are not corrected and dealt with, if it's just platicated and made to feel like, well, it's okay, they will continue to act out because they have not had the issue dealt with. But there is something about the act of correction. There is something about the chastening that literally brings healing and the bringing that child back to the position where they can literally think healthy and normal thoughts and processes themselves. You want your child to be able to go on and get on with it? It's got to be confronted. It's got to be dealt with. Now, if we can understand that about our children, what about the children of God? How much more do we as children of God think that we can get by with things and God just kind of ignore it? This is the problem with this kind of grace unto lasciviousness mindset. This grace that covers everything and I don't have to worry about anything, God forgives it all. No, let me tell you something, friend. God loves you enough that when he has to bring you into that place of correction and, uh, and affliction, he does it because he loves you. The curse was on the ground for your sake. It's for your benefit. Well, Brother Bodie, are you saying all suffering comes from divine repercussions for our, for, for our actions? No, very, very adamantly no. Some suffering is because of other people's dumb actions. <laughs> it's not because of what you did. You just suffer because people did it as much. But I will tell you, I will declare to you unequivocally that all suffering has eternal rewards and benefits. Do you hear me? Not some, all. All of it is for our good. If you believe the book of Romans chapter 8, all things are for our good. Then, then friend, you should have no problem being able to trust God and say, God, I know that you are doing whatever I go through. You're doing it for my sake. I'm telling you the ground was cursed for Adam's sake. If, if Adam had not had that labor, he would have forever been in a place of hopelessness and, and, and sorrow. But God allowed him to have something to have to deal with so that he could come to a place of feeling good about himself. Now watch this. Go, to, go back to the book of Romans. Take your Bible and follow with me. It's a fabulous section of scriptures. Go to verse 18. It's not the only time I've dealt with this verse lately. I love it. It's one of my main verses. For I reckon that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared to the glory which shall be revealed in us. Somebody shout glory. <laughs> That's an encouraging scripture, friend. The fact that things that we deal with now, it's going to be worth every bit of it when we get to heaven. Someone shout amen. amen. For the earnest expectation of the creature waiteth the manifestation of the sons of God. What does that mean? It means that we do not yet know what we shall be like, but we shall be like him. That's what that means means we're going to know things like he knows things. We're going to have a glorified body like unto his glorified body. We, are not, we do not have the manifestation of the sons of God yet, but there's coming a day. And until then, this creature is waiting for that divine expectation. For the creature, verse 20, was made subject to vanity. Somebody say vanity. Now, let me take a little brief detour here and tag into this word, word of vanity. You go back and read the, the writings of Solomon in the book of Ecclesiastes. And he is constantly saying, this is vanity and that was vanity and vexation. Vanity here, vanity there. Everything I put my hand to, it was vanity and vexation. Boy, he's pretty dismal about life. But watch this. The creature was made subject to vanity. Not willingly, 
You gave me my choice. I want back there in the garden. You give me my choice. I don't want to have to labor all day long and have to suffer and worry about whether I'm going to have sufficient to eat. I really don't like living that kind of lifestyle. I wish I had a maid cooking me stuff, a nice chef where I could lay out what kind of meals I want, not have to worry where the money's coming from. That'd be nice, I think. But anyway, the creature was made subject to vanity, not willingly, but by reason of him who subjected the same in hope. If you're looking at your scripture, I hope you, I, I hope you really catch on to what, is, what he is saying here. Because he made us subject to this vanity and vexation. We didn't want to do it, but he did it because he subjected the same in hope. Somebody say in hope. In hope. Say it again, in hope. in hope. I want you to tag in on that. Because the creature itself also shall be delivered from the bondage of corruption into the glorious liberty of the children of God. It's not always going to be this way. It's not always going to be pain in the body, Sister Gibson. It's not always going to be suffering in life, the frustrations that we deal with. There is coming a day where all of this that has brought us tears are going to turn to to, to laughter and joy. The only tears that is in heaven are the tears that have been bottled up and they are to remind God of the suffering we went through. But friend, there's not going to be any free flow in tears. Uh, no more sorrow, no more death, no more parting, no more pain, nothing like that when we get to heaven. As a matter of fact, Adam's paradise is going to look pretty, pretty bleak and plain compared to what heaven's going to look like. Remember me telling you about Jack Cunningham was over Thailand. He was in one of those tourist shops where they had a lot of jasper in there. And uh, he picked up one, turned it over, looked at the price tag, sat it back down again real quick, realized that might be just a little bit rich for his pocketbook, a little unnecessary expense if you're a steward of the things of God. And uh, the little saleswoman came up to him, oh, you want to buy? You know? Begin to talk to him about all that kind of stuff. And he, he did nah, no. You know, like, no, it's no, no problem. He said, it's just at home. My walls are made out of Jasper. He just didn't tell her where home was at. She got to thinking it was back in America. It wasn't, it wasn't there. It's when we get to walk on those streets of gold and we get those beautiful Whatever God has got for us to dwell in, I'm I'm telling you, it's going to defy the description. It's going to be greater than anything that we can comprehend or imagine when we get over there. You talk about the glorious liberty, friend. We're going to take off bodies of corruption. We're going to take off the things of this world, uh, and we are going to become like him. Adam and Eve in the garden knew no death. No pain, no aging, no sags, no no laugh lines, no spare tires. They didn't know any of that kind of stuff. They didn't know indigestion. They didn't know all that kind of junk. All they knew was what tree we're going to eat from today. I'd like to know what it looked like. I'd like to know what it was like. All of that in the garden. And and we don't know how long they stayed in the garden. Scripture doesn't tell us how long they dwelt in the garden. But the moment they ate of the fruit, the tree of knowledge of good and evil, death entered into the world. Their pain started. Their agony started. They found out what thorns and thistles feel like. She found out what childbirth is like. Just about like a man with the flu. Horrible. Things that sorrow of death, sorrow of all of those things that came upon them. But I want to tell you, as there's coming a day, we're going to take off the bodies of this corruption. 
and we're going to take on his glorified body. And oh, friend, it's going to be great when we get there. Pay attention to this line of divine logic. There are, there are arguments of logic, X, 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 and so you can arrive at this. Watch what God says here when, when Paul is writing the book of Romans, Romans chapter 5. I'm going to go down to verse 3 for save a little time. And he says, not only so, talking about glory, but he says, not only so, but we glory in tribulations also. The curse, somebody say the curse, was for my sake. We glory in tribulations. That is a paradox that is hard for a lot of people to wrap their minds around. But I want you to have enough confidence that whatever you suffer under, whatever tribulations we, we go through, God's got a plan and he has a design with it. And I trust him and he's going to do all right with it. Watch it. We glory in tribulations also, knowing that tribulation worketh patience. And patience produces experience. And experience produces hope. And hope maketh not a shame because of the love of God that is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost, which is given unto us. He puts it down there. He starts with tribulation. He ends up with hope. He starts with pain and suffering. He ends up with joy. He starts out with all kinds of agony and he ends up with something that can give you confidence and peace and everything's going to be all right. Somebody shout amen. Because the curse was put there for my sake. I'm not cursed. It's the world I live in that is cursed. But God did it. I, I, I go to that scripture. You remember the time the, the, the children of Israel uh, went into the land of Canaan. The period of time that we refer to as the conquest of Canaan. They, they, uh, they went in there, they obeyed God at the first sit, uh, city, mostly outside of that one idiot by the name of Achan, and uh, he stole some things and got everybody in trouble for it because you don't do sin and not have consequences. But, but you know, Jericho, the walls fell, great victory took place. Uh, AI right after that, great sorrow because of the disobedience of sin. And the Lord is showing us the typology that uh, even after great victories, if there's somebody that is willfully doing things that are wrong, it will impact all of us. So your sin affects the rest. Be careful because your sin is not a private sin. It affects public people, other people. And from there, they went over and they began to take cities. The dividing up of the, of the, the uh, lots of to where each one of the tribes had a certain section that they were to inhabit. Now, when they went there to inhabit, the major cities, the major part of Canaan was already accomplished as Israel fought it as a whole. They, they intimidated the land. They put out their might in the land. They showed them what they were, could do. But then it was left up to each tribe to go in and drive out the inhabitants of their spot of ground. Unfortunately, many, many, many of the tribes did not do it. Scripture over and again says, but they did not drive out the, and he puts it like that. But there's one place that the Bible says that God left and he begins to name off five different heathen tribes heathen group of peoples that God left inside of Israel, of the land that they came, the, the land of promise, the land that flowed with milk and with honey. God left them because they did not do what they were supposed to. And while God could have, are you with me? God could have made it easy on them and got rid of them for them. God left them the scripture said. And then he explains himself. He said to teach the children to war. 
You didn't drive them out. You didn't obey God. There's consequences from disobeying God. And so you see, if, if something doesn't happen, your children are not going to understand the price of the victory that you fought for. And so he left them for their sake. To teach those kids war. You see, the curse was for my good. Now hang on, I want to show you this and then I'm going to bring it to a close. Go to Deuteronomy chapter 23. Uh, here, here Moses in his last book as he's recapping things to Israel and given his last thoughts and lost memoirs as he's writing here. He goes back and he, he reminds them of something that took place in, during the book of what we call Numbers. When they were going through uh, a particular spot of the wilderness and Balak, the king, uh, called Balaam. And he asked Balaam to come and to curse the people of Israel. Now, the people of Israel had not done one solitary thing to him. They didn't, all they asked for was just safe passage through his land. That's all they wanted. They didn't want to take it over. They had done that to others. But this particular time, it was just that they were going to pass through the land. And the guy couldn't stand it. And so... He literally paid for a man to come in and curse them. So Moses is reminding them here, Nevertheless, the Lord thy God would not hearken to Balaam, but the Lord thy God turned the curse into a blessing unto thee because the Lord thy God loved thee. Ooh. You hear that devil? You can curse all you want to, but he's going to turn it to my blessing because I am loved of God. The ground may get cursed, but I'm not cursed. God loves me. I feel the Holy Ghost right now. I wished it was a Sunday night and we had a house jam-packed. I feel like it wouldn't have been all that hard to watch these aisles been run, people getting joy and deliverance because I want you to have the confidence. Hear me today. Those of you that are out there listening by, by webcam, I'm I'm pleading with you, listen to what the Lord is saying unto the church. He's telling you he loves you. He's doing whatever it is. He's doing it for your good, not to destroy you. Because God loves you. Let's lift up our hands. Let's stand to our feet. Let's lift up our hands and let's love God. Let's magnify God. I thank you, Lord, for your divine love that you have shed upon us. I thank, oh my, my, my. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be the Lord our God. You are faithful, righteous, and true. Uh, God, you're good in everything that you do. We want to magnify you tonight, God. Fill us with praise. Fill us with honor. Fill us, God, with words of glory unto our God. For our God is great and greatly to be praised. Blessed be the name of the Lord. We love you, Jesus. We love you, Jesus. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Amen. And let the church say amen. amen. Say it again. Amen. amen. God bless you. We love you. Thank you for being here on this Wednesday night. You're dismissed in Jesus' name. Praise God. Nate.